There are many cultural similarities between the peoples of the United Kingdom and Eastern Europe. Beautiful weather, friendly neighbours, thoughtful and caring government. Great supine protoplasmic invertebrate jellies. A stalwart culture of sobriety and tea totality. And most people in either camps can't speak a lick of English. A brisk walk through Boscombe, nine times out of ten, feels like a peaceful stroll through Warsaw. That's got to be the best part I've ever seen. But above all else, our cultures have zones. Inhospitable and uninhabitable inhabitable wastelands filled with incomprehensible paranormal activity, roaming packs of mutants, and, worst of all, chavvies. I'm mud crabs more fearsome than you. Die, In Eastern Europe, the zone is called Chernobyl. In the UK, it's Liverpool. I explored the highest valued properties in Liverpool and perused through the various Heinz ketchup anomalies before delving into the center of the Liverpool exclusion zone and the heart of its pain and suffering. Anfield. And it is here when I realized I really gotta make a stalker video. Stalker is a masterpiece. What the fuck? Oh my god! <laughs> A game so dedicated to the immersion of traversing the dissolute Ukrainian countryside, battling countless abominations and supernatural phenomena, and succumbing to the Norwood Reaper from radiation overexposure, that the game itself slowly begins to break apart. I've seen things. And starts acting like an anomaly in and of itself. Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl, is perhaps the greatest cultural export to come from the former Soviet bloc since the collapse of communism. It's like DayZ, if DayZ had any content, and if you could play it on your own, interact with real human beings, trade your goods, explore the land and find weird, wonderful, and woeful artifacts. <laughs> I just walked into a fucking anomaly! Great, 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 fucking great! Nice one, Yoshi! Fucking nice one! And spontaneously combusts at any given moment for exceeding the game's weight limit, retroactively causing your CPU to explode because of a rogue piece of Cyrillic coding left unattended and forgotten about for 17 years. Like any good game, you start out comatose, amnesiac, hungover from a night of debauchery and vodka consumption. And as I'm sure is a common occurrence for the people neighboring the area, you suddenly wake up in the Chernobyl exclusion zone with no money, no a collection of how you got here, a tramp stamp on your arm, and a note telling you to kill some guy who probably owes you drinking money. A situation many an Englishman can relate to. Your objective is simple. First and foremost, survive. But just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. After half an hour of gameplay, clearing out a bandit camp, saving an amputee from almost certain death, and braving a den of malnourished, brittle, teethless Soviet doggos, I return to Sidirovich for payment, only to die of a heart attack mid-conversation. This is the stalker experience. In actuality, Stalker is not that complex. You need guns, ammo for said guns, you need armor, you need medical supplies, you need vodka. You need cold hard cash to buy said vodka with. Because as we all know, vodka has anti-radiation properties, which explains the abhorrent rate of alcoholism in the Eastern world. Because if I lived next to a plot of land that spewed out radiation, like Twitter users spew out shit, I too would be glowing green and downing a bottle of Jack Daniels every night before bed. The basic gameplay loop of Stalker is very simple. You're given a main questline to follow to pay off your debts to Sidirovich, and ironically, the whole finding and killing Strelok thing is basically an optional side quest. You can essentially choose to completely ignore hunting this dude down in favor of helping this greasy gremlin man afford his next import of a KFC bargain bucket. A luxury in the zone when you consider everyone's main diet primarily consists of a Monster Ultra, a tin of sardines, and a raw uncooked sausage. Ah yes, the European breakfast. Like in real life, Monster Ultra can be used to restore your stamina, whereas you can use the raw sausage to restore your health by plugging your open wounds with the raw uncooked pork. Given how much shooting is in Stalker, you are likely going to be going through so many bandages you'll end the game looking like a mummy, and I don't mean the sexy kind. Since we're on the topic of healing items, let's talk about the combat itself, because the combat in Stalker is... Uh, believe me when I tell you that the combat in Stalker is actually very good, but you wouldn't know this from the first combat encounter. The first bandit camp is probably the greatest tarred filter I've ever seen in a video game. If the rest of the reasonably diegetic tutorial segment within the cordon section of the game isn't enough to make your average normie pull out his own hair from how complex and convoluted the base game mechanics are, the shooting is. You start off with nothing but a Makarov, which is about as effective as a pea shooter, and if you're lucky, you will gain access to a double 
loud shotgun, which makes the Doom 3 shotgun look like a sniper rifle. This does, however, work in the game's favor, because there is a very obvious rhythm to the game's combat, even early on. The shotgun is best suited to rushing and flanking enemies, while the Makarov is more suited to more head-on engagements from a safer range or from behind cover. It's very limited and very clunky, yes, but the clunk is more down to the fact that all the early game weapons are very simple and very obviously limited by their inherent designs. You very quickly come across more effective pieces of kit as you progress through the game, and the weapon progression system throughout the entire game is actually very good. You go from pistols to shotguns to automatic SMGs to AKs and M4 platforms, and eventually to scoped carbines and experimental gorse rifles, all with steadily escalating power levels alongside the enemy's complementary skill levels. You start off alongside dipshit gopnik bandits to reasonably trained army grunts, to veteran mercenaries to the expert monolith cult, and I'd argue that Stalker's progression system is the best part about the game, because by the time you reach the Chernobyl power plant itself, it feels like a completely different game. Stalker is utterly unrecognizable from the early stages to the late stages, and yet somehow the progression all feels natural and well fucking earned. Oh yeah, and all the weapons suffer from durability degradation. Why is this important? Well, remember Far Cry 2's jamming mechanics? Yeah. It's way more simplified and way less animated, but serves much the same purpose. Although the AI and combat encounters are way less dynamic than Far Cry 2's, so your gun jamming is way more of an inconvenience than a tension adjective, as in Far Cry 2, but it's still a very welcome layer of complexity to the combat system that works wonders in enhancing the overall strategy to the base gameplay and the reward for finding new pieces of kit. One thing I will say about the combat, however, not only are all the weapons more comically inaccurate than the entirety of enemy at the gates, but every enemy in Stalker tanks body shots like, well, a fucking tank. Seriously, try to get a kill off of anyone with body shots. You will not be able to do it. Even the most financially destitute Gopnik this side of the Dnieper River has such a high pain tolerance and such finely woven body armor that they essentially turn into self-aware, highly aggressive, and very sapient zombies. Except they can also use guns and shout slurs at you in Russian. Oh fuck, I just realized this game does actually have zombies as well. And yeah, they also use guns and shout slurs at you. And by slurs, I mean... <laughs> There is a seismic miasma of factions spread out throughout Stalker. 90% of them are hostile. The other 10% that won't shoot you on sight only refuse to because they're already preoccupied with shooting everyone else on sight. Bandits, army grunts, spetsnaz, mercenaries, all essentially the same generic bad guys, at least outwardly, but with steadily scaling equipment and power levels. Their intentions, ambitions, and their motivations are largely irrelevant because they largely involve shooting you in the face. And I'm more than happy to return the favor. It's not until you reach the bar where you can actually associate with a group of interest who won't just try to kill you and nick all your shit. The bar itself is the central hub area connecting all the other locations in Stalker, and it is by said, far the cozy- ah! Don't stand there! I said come in! Don't stand there! It is by far the coziest segment in the game. The music is amazing. Gerza Dreaming by Adaraya is constantly playing on a loop whenever you enter the bar, and to be honest, if ever I open up a dingy little dive bar in the basement of some old abandoned steel factory in the middle of an irradiated wasteland filled with death and horror around every corner, I would want this song playing 24-7 as well. It perfectly exemplifies the calm, soothing, familiar atmosphere of the bar itself as a place where people go to get slosh and briefly escape the woes of everyday life within the zone, as well as perfectly personifying the mystique and uncanny atmosphere of the entire game, but you'll yearn to hear its siren call one more time every time you're in the area, trading your gear and stocking up ammunition. This song is so good, it fucking hijacked my segment about the factions. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Duty. Duty is a faction who hangs out near the bar. They are named as such because they believe in service and order above all else, and in protecting the world from the zone. They are not terribly interesting. Then you have their rivals and diametric opposites, Freedom. Anarchists who believe the secrets of the zone should be open to all to 
peruse and access. They are also violent drunken assholes. Behave, okay? Got it? Try fooling around and you'll be sorry. We had a slow-witted one here once. He pissed off everyone so bad we had to make him take a hike on the minefield. Naked. You should have heard Skin Flint cursing when that dude's arm fell square on his head. <laughs> Yeah, I jumped on with duty. I did it once, I did it twice, and I'll fucking do it again. The underlying irony about the game having all these factions, and most of them being openly hostile to you, however, is that the presence and activities of said factions are inherently absurd. Because they're all trying to enforce their own ideologies and intentions onto a force of nature, or rather, super nature, that is completely beyond our understanding. Much of the bandits are from abroad trying to hide from the authorities. Duty want to protect the world from the zone, seemingly ignorant of the fact that the zone is cordoned off and that the biggest threats are coming from outside rather than from within. A dilemma mirrored in freedom, who are anarchists and therefore stupid. The army just doesn't want to be there whatsoever, and sells for charging you 500 rubles to pass by the odd checkpoint. And by the way, 500 rubles is... it's like four quid. The mercs? Who knows? They serve the highest bidder, likely hoarding artifacts for collectors or foreign governments. The ecologists are based. Eggheads whose sole purpose in life is to study the zone. A futile endeavor, you might argue, but not to me. Especially when these fuckers pay so well for every artifact I sell them. If you're ever running short on cash, grab a bunch of artifacts and sell them off to the ecologists, and you'll be rich enough to buy 50 exoskeletons by the end of the game. And then you have the Monolith, a heavily armed, heavily armored death cult who believe in the center of the zone there is a massive alien monolith that they dedicate their lives to protecting, waging war on anyone who dares set foot anywhere near their territory in the zone. Monolith are the baddest motherfuckers in the land. They hit like dump trucks, and they can take more punishment than Rasputin. They are also the most mysterious group in Stalker, because so little is known about them, outside the fact that they are either clearly insane or else brainwashed, which explains the suspicious level of simpery I see for them on the internet. To summarize, the factions are all kinda stupid. Some of their goals are noble, some are not, but the zone really couldn't give any less of a shit. It couldn't give any less of a shit about you if you were a do-gooder, dutier, or a morally destitute bandit. It will swat you like a fly with much the same prejudice, more so if you're a loner such as yourself. Regardless, contrary to what I've been saying, Stalker is not actually just about running around the countryside shooting random people, because Stalker has side quests that allow you to take missions to run around the countryside and kill random people. <laughs> Oh, Jesus! Ah! Yes, side quests. And guess what? Most of them are radiant. The vast majority of side quests you encounter in Stalker are very rudimentary. It's always either kill some guy... <sighs> find some item or wipe out a horde of mutants, with very little variation in between. The most interesting segments of the game are arguably the X-Labs, experimental underground laboratories haunted by actual honest-to-god poltergeists. Spooky noises. Theoretically, you can use these side quests to earn money and or anomalies, which you can just as easily find wandering throughout the world. The anomalies are preferable because outside of being able to sell them for mad stacks to Shakarov, you can equip them to either induce copious amounts of radiation poisoning, or else give you infinite stamina, a massively beneficial trait given how much backtracking there is throughout the mid-stages of the game. But all this is window dressing to a largely atmospheric experience. The atmosphere in Stalker is king. The soundtrack is largely ambient and diegetic. It's the distant howls of mutants in the distance and the billowing of the wind gliding through the air. It's the complacent droning from the military checkpoint and the cozy guitar strumming campfire sessions around the newbie camp. It's the uncanny familiarity of the ordinary overcast countryside married with time and space folding in on itself, and spatial anomalies ravaging the geometry. The zone itself induces a sense of fear and trepidation in you, the player, as much as it does a sense of curiosity. An opportunity for you to escape the confinements of modern society and act out all of your innermost desires, which, ironically, is the entire point of the zone. I won't spoil anything for you regarding the endings, of which there are like seven of them, all accounting for your actions throughout the game and some of the plot lines you may or may not have followed up on. However, I will say this. Holy fucking shit, you will die. A lot. The Chernobyl power plant and the subsequent final battle therein is brutal. It is a gauntlet of pain. Legions and legions of monolith goons sporting the best gear in the game who can so much as kill you by flicking a speck of dust in your direction. This is the true stalker experience. Thank you all for watching, and special shout out to the very generous Patreon donors for their continued support for this channel. Terribly sorry for the delay. New video will be out way sooner. And of course, I will be live streaming the stalker sequel 
footfalls over the weekends, Saturdays and Sundays, 7pm British Standard Time. Come on in and say hello, it'll be a lot of fun. Thanks again everyone, and please, have a great day.